what I want to talk about here is just some of the numbers that help to frame where we're at and why innovation needs to occur on farm in general around the world. And then we'll gradually specify that down to, um, down to an Australian level. So these are, these are sort of big numbers and what we're looking at is in, in 2050, the population will be growing and that'll be, there's expected to be an additional 32% um, of the population. And further to that, the population will require a higher calorie uh, requirement on a daily basis. The prediction that comes from both of those is that food production needs to increase by more than 50%. So as farmers who are using irrigation to grow crops, that's a really significant driver to innovate. They, there's, a, there's a very strong need for them to change the way they do things and to continue to be more productive. At the same time, we're in a scenario where there's limited resources. So there's a certain amount of arable land available to us as we know it now. And because of the growth in population, that's expected to decrease by 20% per capita. Um, what that means is that there'll be a deficit in the available water and that the characterisation there is that four billion people will live under underwater stress. So again, a very strong global driver that's driving agriculture everywhere. If we bring that now down to the use of water on the global level, uh, we're now on the, on the graph to the right there, um, you can see that around about 70% of um, the available water is used for agriculture. That is then used to irrigate about 20% of the arable land. And then the final one there is that, irrigate, that irrigate, those irrigation methods are largely relatively inefficient. And efficiency is quite a difficult term to use when you're talking about irrigation, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, generally speaking, on a global level, there are a lot of people using relatively less efficient means of irrigation. So there's, um, there's a driver there for that to increase. Again, just uh, some big picture stuff. This is um, where agriculture exists in the world. And you can overlay that. You can see the areas in red there are those areas which are defined to be exposed to water stress. And then you can look at agricultural efficiency. And this is purely just a, um, an overview in terms of crop yield, so actual yield um, compared with relative potential. You can see Australia, if I can get a pointer going here. No, perhaps not. Yes, I can. Australia is definitely at the higher end of the um, agricultural productivity scale. But uh, as I'll talk about, there's, there's still some, some scope for improvement there. OK, still on the global level, what we're seeing is, is farm consolidation. And I don't have the Australian data to hand. I'm sure there's people who do in the room. But um, here we can see from the US, and here we can see some European countries where we're looking at the average farm size. And you can see that's increasing over the years. That's definitely something we're seeing in Australia. As I said, I can't quantify it, but it is definitely occurring. And that changes the type of farmer that we're seeing. And this is something I see in my in my day-to-day -day role, that we're now dealing with consolidated areas of more of the corporate style, the ag investors, people who treat farming in a slightly different manner. And what we see is that they strive more for advanced practice adoption. They're more comfortable with adopting new practices. And I believe that's a strong driver for innovation as well. Having someone who's willing um, and certainly capable of bringing in new practices and implementing them on farm. So I guess putting those last few slides together, we get a, a, a sort of a picture of, of where we're at. We have a situation where there's a growing demand for food due to population growth and the requirement for an increased calorie consumption. We have limited supply factors, both land and water are scarce resources. And again, I'll come back to this, this term here. I know that's a little blunt there, but um, 
largely speaking around the world, water that is used in agriculture could be used more efficiently. What that is driving is an increased demand for water efficient solutions and coupled with that higher productivity. So I'll finish with this one on the, uh, the sort of global scale. This is not necessarily related to irrigation, but what it shows is that there's a lot of consolidation, mergers and acquisitions, a lot of activity in the on-farm business marketplace. So these are large companies that have recently merged together. And I believe that's occurring because there's a need for them to innovate and they believe that they can be more powerful if they share the synergies that come with those mergers. That's happening in the irrigation market as well. It's not quite as, uh, the numbers are certainly not quite as um, dazzling as, as those ones there. Um, but these are really significant companies uh, merging together. And I think that's an indicator that, that innovation is well and truly already happening. So let's come down to Australia and we'll start now to bring it down to the, the farm level. I'll stop with the, the global talk. And I mentioned that efficiency is a, is a tricky word. The reason it's tricky is that each of these application methods here, we have gravity through to drip, each of them do have broadly speaking, a range of efficiency. But the way that they're used by the individual dramatically um, relates to what efficiency can be obtained from those um, methods. So it's always quite tricky to talk about what is more efficient than, than something else. But generally speaking, you can rank them in this type of um, order here, where you have the less efficient uh, methods at the top down to the more efficient methods at the bottom. I'll briefly just go through those for those who may not be that familiar with, with irrigation in Australia. Um, we have gravity flood or surface irrigation as it's known here. That relates to the top two images there and they're quite typical of what you see in terms of um, surface irrigation systems in Australia. You have either a series of, of channels or you might have a whole bay that is uh, flooded with, with water. And in many cases, you might have a header channel here with siphons leading out of that to irrigate down those channels. Purposefully left a person in this, uh, in this image because uh, each of those siphons does need to be started manually and so I think it's, it sort of talks to the potential for innovation um, where you're, you're removing that, that labour requirement as you change to different methods. So that's that's the top one, that's gravity or flood or surface irrigation. You've then got a range of sprinkler um, irrigation application methods. And they range a little bit in terms of their efficiencies. So the, some of the, I guess, less efficient methods are these two here. This is a big gun, so you might have seen these. They're quite visible as you're driving through, um, through agricultural regions. Um, basically a big jet of water that goes in a circle and it's towed through the, um, through the crop. Then you've got these wheel move systems. Again, if, you've, if you live in an area where they grow loosen or some vegetables, you would have seen those. Also in the sprinkler category though, you have devices such as this uh, centre pivot here or lateral move machines. And here it's still a sprinkler irrigated method, but it's, it's more efficient because of the ability to adjust the speed of the pivot and adjust the flow of the nozzles and the ability to control it without the requirement for somebody to be involved. And then the, the final one that you've got there is a picture of, um, of drip irrigation. Specifically, that is, that's drip in a vineyard. And um, I do want to make the point that crops in Australia have evolved to use particular irrigation methods. And that, I think it's important to remember that that's not necessarily, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So you can flood irrigate a vineyard, and in years gone by that was certainly the, the chosen method, just as you can irrigate a rice field with drip. So it's not necessarily, I think there's in some cases a misconception there that a particular irrigation method needs to match the crop, that's, that's not always the case. Um, in terms of why you get the efficiencies, I think it's 
it seems relatively um, sort of anecdotally <coughs> evident to me. Um, when you have water in the field, subject to evaporation, subject to um, wind drift, in this, in this case you can see already there there's um, some wind taking effect there, you lose the efficiency to some degree of the system. You're not, when we're talking efficiency here, we're talking about delivering a certain volume of water to the crop that requires it. As you move along the spectrum, you're then delivering a more precise amount of water with less potential for losses along the way. So before anybody questions me later about um, the fact that why are particular methods used in Australia, there's some really uh, strong drivers as to why surface irrigation is still quite prevalent in Australia. And it's, uh, it's this here, you can see this is the variability of our, of our rainfall. What you see in the top graph there is surface irrigation is the red line and the other two lines are sprinkler and drip. And you can see the high variability, and this is the area of land which is irrigated by <coughs> surface irrigation in a given, in a given year. Uh, the ABS doesn't, hasn't done it every year, but um, what you see is that from a peak here in 2005, a significant drop. And the reason for that is, as we all know, that was the drought. Water was not available. To invest in a sprinkler or a drip system requires a capital investment you're installing equipment in the field. And if you don't have a good degree of reliability that you can operate these systems, then it's unlikely to be a wise investment. So in many areas in Australia, you have low security of water, and therefore you're actually essentially almost forced down a certain path, which is surface irrigation. And, and what happens there is these systems, they still were out there they just didn't have any water go through them for two, three, four um, years. So those farmers needed to wear the, the wear the loss. Had they had the capital investment of a, a pivot or a drip system in the field, then obviously their losses would have been much greater. So I say that because um, I think it's important to realise that it's not just that a farmer can make a decision to um, change an irrigation application method. There's a lot of other factors at play as well. So you saw earlier, I had the global picture of how much was flood, sprinkler and drip. This is the Australian situation uh, as of 2013, 2013 and 14. And it's a little bit hard to read, I'm sorry, but if you start from the top, it, uh, it goes through the list in this way. So you have about 60% surface flood gravity irrigation in Australia. You then have the two drip, both subsurface and above surface drip applications here come to about 11%, 4% uh, in microspray and then the balance in uh, overhead sprinkler methods. I think in the current environment, I think it's good to see this because although certain farmers will still be required to go for a particular application method because of their environmental situation like I explained on the previous slide, I think this shows that there is still some significant upside to improvement in irrigation efficiency in Australia through just simply changing application methods. And I think it's particularly valid in this session because we have the federal government who's investing in improving <coughs> irrigation infrastructure. And I think it should be a positive sign that, at least in my opinion, there is room for improvement with efficiency in, uh, in agriculture. And simply just on this alone, just on the application methods that are used. So that was the on-farm application method side. I want, said I wanted to talk about, um, about technology as well. What you see here is two tables prepared by the Boston Consulting Group last year. And what they show, what shows in this one is this is investment in ag tech. And you can see it's dramatically growing in the last few years. So people are realising that there's investment potential in technology for agriculture. Interestingly, in this case, that's despite falling farm incomes, at least in the US. So that's a pretty significant sign. If you break that down here, what you see is the biggest, these are the investment categories that these companies then allocated um, for their investment. 
And you can see the biggest one is big data and analytics. And that's, that was a recurring theme from the digital session earlier where um, they're seeing the ability to collect large amounts of data and make decisions on that. The session earlier talked more about all the off-farm data packs that are available, 2,900 I think it was. When you're talking about on-farm, you're talking about collecting site-specific data. And the way that looks in, in the industry we're from, which is the on-farm, it's about collecting data from the field. So here's, this is a, a page just taken from one of our um, Irrigation Australia member websites. And it just demonstrates the sorts of things that you'd want to collect. So you're taking soil moisture, plant characteristics, weather, wind, etc., etc flows in the system. You're taking that information, putting it up in the cloud, combining that with all the data that's available from all the other sources out there, and then making decisions and enabling that decision to be then um, creating an action in the field. And this is, this is very much the, the next wave, if you like. So application methods are, are, are there, but this is the, the front line, and this is the next wave, I believe, of what will take the next gain in efficiency for irrigation. And I think it's demonstrated by the fact that there are a significant number of companies right now vying for a system that can do what I showed in that previous slide the best. Um, at the moment, this is a snapshot of the companies that were at our exhibition last year. Um, there's just been a proliferation of companies that are trying to design and develop a system that does what I showed in the previous slide. And it's, I think it's really heartening to see. Um, in one, in a, one case, one of those companies has been purchased by a, a large um, overseas company. So you can see there's a lot of activity. And this, as I said, this is the front line. Someone who comes up with this system, I think, they recognise that there's, uh, there's big potential there. So I'll finish, I'm going to just finish with a quote because it's quite, I think it's an interesting quote, and it's a little bit of a plug for Irrigation Australia's um, training and certification program as well, um, in that you can have all the technology and you can have the best application methods, yet if you don't have the intelligence to be able to drive the system, then you won't get the outcome. I haven't, I've purposefully not put the uh, who said that quote, because I thought I'd ask if anybody knows who said that, because it's quite interesting. No? It's, uh, it's relevant because we're, in, uh, because we're in Canberra. It was Alfred Deakin back in 1890. So he was our, he's probably better political scholars than me, but as far as I know, he was our second prime minister. 1890, he wasn't the prime minister, but he was, I think, the commissioner for water. And he was quoted as saying that during a speech to a conference for irrigationists, which is a term that's uh, gone by the wayside. And I just think it's really relevant, but A, the fact that he said that in 1890 and it's still relevant today, and obviously because we're in Canberra and he was the Prime Minister. So there's my contact details, please feel free to um, grab me, I'll be here for the next day or so anyway, but um, if you want to get in touch then it's my contact details up there. Thanks for your time. <laughs>